Hello, my name is Kevin Hind and this presentation is entitled An Introduction to Markets. We're going to examine the basic components of the market economy and in particular we're going to examine demand and then supply and equilibrium in markets and what leads to changes in equilibrium price and quantity in the market and we're going to finish off by examining what are the benefits of the market. So what exactly is the market economy? Well it, it's made up of two component parts. On the one hand there are consumers, on the other hand there are sellers. And a market is really any arrangement that enables buyers and sellers to exchange goods and services for a price. Markets can be any sort of institutional arrangement. We can think about the, the local market in maybe the town centre or indeed just the local shop or indeed we could think about using the internet indeed eBay is uh, a magnificent example of where buyers and sellers come together to determine the price of a good and there are lots and lots of things that are sold on uh, in, in shops and in markets eBay for example in eBay you can buy cars laptops, car accessories, handbags, and cameras, mobile phones, golf clubs, furniture, art, art and antiques, uh, books, comics and magazines, well a multitude of things. And of course markets can involve very simple transactions, for example buying a, a newspaper or, or buying a, a bag of tomatoes or more complex transactions. Um, for example buying a, a nuclear power station. There is also a framework of law that protects exchange and it's usually used when there are difficulties in the exchange pr process but sometimes uh, there are uh, certain parties in the exchange that are not always satisfied by it. For example if there are rogue traders out there then ultimately uh, consumers may be dissatisfied if they can't get any help via the law. Markets um, can be for two general sorts of products, one what we might call homogenous products, um, these tend to have one price. By homogenous product we mean that they're homogenous at least in the eyes of the consumer um, and they normally involve commodities such as gold, oil, wheat, um, things like cocoa, coffee, tea and they are they tend to have uh, more of a, a uniqueness in the sense that they are uh, of one type so it's very difficult for sellers particularly if the market is very competitive to raise the price of these products and then because they, any, any seller that actually tries to raise the price will be undercut by another seller trying to make a profit at a lower price so markets in homogenous products tend to have one price because con consumers have information about them and sellers can't really um, alter their price um, dramatically though of course oil is in itself a special case. Markets for differentiated products such as cars or say laptops these are things which are differentiated by design or style uh, often have a wider spread of prices that isn't to say that price isn't important but just that there is a wider spread of prices uh, for example think of the car market consumers look at different types of model of car based upon the performance or the uh, space that they have inside them or their looks there are a number of attributes and it's not just price that is important so often you find a wider spread of prices in these sorts of um, markets now what we're going to be looking at in this particular talk is largely the market for homogenous goods and markets are seen to be perfect and very competitive but the forces that are prevalent in, in markets are actually relevant to all types of products so let's begin our journey by looking at demand
what exactly then determines the market demand for any product? Uh, of course, there can be a multitude of uh, influences on the demand for a product. It just depends what the product is. Uh, what, for example, might determine the demand for bottled water? Well, a number of things might influence that. And we put down some key determinants here. For example, price would be very important for consumers. It would determine if the price was too high, then that might put off a lot of consumers. But if the price was lowered, then a lot of consumers may come into the market and buy more bottled water. Another influence on market demand for bottled water might be the price of substitute goods, such as, for example, uh, bottled orange juice. If the price of bottled orange juice actually fell relative to the price of bottled water, then people would switch out of buying bottled water and be more likely to buy the uh, cheaper uh, orange juice, uh, bottled orange juice product. So the prices of alternatives that, are, that might be seen as substitute goods are seen to be important in determining demand for a product. Also important are income levels. Usually we could say that as income rises, then consumers will buy more of a product. Now there are one or two cases where um, as the incomes rise we buy less of the product and a good example of that is bread. It seems that as we get richer we tend to buy uh, actually less bread. Um, and so, but generally we would say that as incomes rise we actually buy more of a product. Uh, and that would be the case of bottled water. Also of course the, the tastes and preferences that consumers have for the product uh, will, will matter. So if there's a, a, a trend in buying bottled water, for example, you see, seem to see a lot of people buying bottled water and taking it with them to the gym or, or actually maybe taking it to work and drinking it at work, then if that trend occurs and there's a taste or a preference from consumers for bottled water, then that will be prevalent in the market. That will be an important determinant in de demand. Also, of course, advertising. If firms start advertising bottled water, then this might uh, increase the demand for bottled water. Basically, people uh, get some form of attachment to the product. Uh, the weather, particularly hot weather, will influence the demand for a product like bottled water. So, um, one would think about the weather as a, an important influence in, in the market demand for bottled water. And, of course, the quality and availability of tap water, which is uh, an important important issue for people who use or consume bottled water. So if you're from a, a region or a locality where the quality of tap water is poor, you might be more likely to buy bottled water, so therefore the demand for bottled water will increase. It doesn't matter what product that we look at, empirical evidence seems to identify a number of key determinants of demand. And in this slide, what we're suggesting is that you can simplify those key determinants by using a shorthand notation. So we put an expression, uh, which is a mathematical expression, uh, to express those key determinants of demand. And it reads as follows that the quantity demanded of good x, that's q dx on the left hand side of this equation, depends upon, or is a function of, that means it's equal to f, the f value, all the variables that are in those brackets, px through to u. px stands for the price of x. The price of substitute goods is given by py, and the price of complement goods are given by pz. The incomes of consumers are given by the, the, the notation Y. And the tastes and preferences of consumers are given by letter T. Everything else is captured by the U. And this is just a shorthand to capture the main determinants of demand. It's not an exhaustive, li exhaustive list. Let's, for example, just quickly think through um, what would determine the demand for coffee, for example. So QDX might be the quantity demanded of coffee. Depends upon the price of coffee. It also depends upon the price of substitutes, PY, like tea. 
and indeed it might depend upon the price of complement goods like cream it also will depend upon things like income and of course tastes there are some nations who are more likely to be coffee lovers than others and other things will matter as well and we just we might for example think about advertising which would influence the demand for coffee um, so there are a number of other things that come into the equation but we simplify them down into these few determinants and the key determinant of demand is seen to be price so what we've done is written the notation that we had on the previous slide and we've shortened that to say that the quantity demanded, the QDX, the quantity demanded of X, depends upon just the price of X, caterus paribus, that means everything else is equal. So uh, things like um, the price of other goods, substitutes and complements and incomes and tastes and any other influences on demand are all held constant. So we're just looking at this one relationship between quantity demanded and the price of the good and we can graph that relationship we've shown on the vertical axis the price of the good and on the horizontal axis the quantity demanded of this good per period of time now mathematicians amongst you might recognize that really the quantity demanded should be on the vertical axis and the uh, price which is an independent variable on the uh, horizontal axis but we, we don't need to worry about that there are some historic reasons why that was put around this way so what we have then is price on the vertical axis, quantity demanded on the horizontal axis. And this relationship between price and quantity is an inverse relationship. That is, as the price falls, the quantity demanded increases. Or as the price rises, the quantity demanded falls. Now in this graph we've shown that at a price of P1, the quantity demanded is Q1. But when the price falls to P2, the quantity demanded increases to Q2 we say there's an expansion or increase in the quantity demanded and there are two reasons for this the first reason is what's called a substitution effect this is a psychological response based upon how we as individuals uh, are thought to behave so as the price of the good falls then what happens is we buy more of this good because this good is cheaper than other goods which um, are seem to be relatively high in price that's called a substitution effect so we substitute away from goods which are relatively high in price towards goods which were relatively low in price there's another effect too because and it's called the income effect so the income effect is when the price of a good falls that means that we've got in fact more spending power so for example if the price of a good fell from £10 to £5 we'd have £5 extra money to spend so we've got this income now we can spend uh, this money on this good if we wanted to or on other goods but basically there are two effects going on here which suggest that uh, as prices fall the quantity demanded rises or as the price rises the quantity demanded falls and those two effects are the substitution effect which is about the relative prices of uh, goods and the income effect which is about the spending power which you have as prices change and this slide just shows what happens when prices go up so if prices went up from P1 to P2 then the quantity demanded would fall from Q1 to Q2 we say there's a contraction or decrease in the quantity demanded and again the rationale for it lies in what's called our substitution effect because as the price of let's say pizzas goes up then we will uh, switch out of buying pizzas and buy let's say burgers uh, which is a substitution effect we substitute away from uh, pizzas which are higher in price than something like uh, burgers but also there's an income effect because if the price of pizzas goes up from five pounds to ten pounds then we have less spending power it affects our income and that may reinforce our um, the substitution effect it may not of course but that's a, a discussion for another time 
Well, we've looked at the uh, factors that determine the demand for the product, but that's only one side of the, the market. We also need to examine those factors which determine the supply of a good or service. And let's have a look at the factors that might determine the supply of bottled water, which was our example when we looked at demand. Well, one important determinant of supply is the price uh, that, that suppliers can get for the good. Remember, if they actually produced one um, bottle of water, that's going to cost them a certain amount for the inputs. Um, and they'll need a price which covers those inputs, but also um, it gives them a return, so it keeps them just being in the supply of bottled water. So that, that's an important determinant. Prices are an important determinant of the quantity supplied. As the prices go up, more water will be supplied. But al also, the prices in alternative markets are something that matter to suppliers of bottled water. For example, at the price of, uh, let's say, uh, orange juice, bottled orange juice actually went up, then that would be very tempting for the suppliers of bottled water. They might well think, well actually I can make more money in supplying bottled juices. So they'd switch out of, the, out of bottled water and into bottled orange juice production. Uh, also, the costs of production uh, are important. If the price of labour goes up, or the price of plastics, if you're making plastic bottles for your, for your water, that if they go up, then that means that you will effectively supply less, uh, because the, the costs have, have risen. Um, on the other hand, if, the, if you have a new technology, let's say for developing plastic bottles, uh, which might use less plastic but makes the bottle stronger, then this would allow you to supply more at the existing prices. There are of course uh, other determinants of uh, the supply of bottled water. Regulation is very important in, uh, food and drink, in the food and drink industry. In the case of water, uh, there are clearly rules on uh, purity. So regulations are very, very important, and meeting those regulations involve a cost to the firm, so therefore would affect the supply. Taxes, particularly on uh, plastic bottles, uh, or indeed on glass bottles, have been around for a, a number of years as part of the environmental campaign. Um, and of course, ultimately, taxes are passed on to some extent to the consumer, but initially, taxes affect producers, they affect the production decision. Uh, certainly taxes of this type, if you're, um, if, if you're going to supply the particular good, you'll have to pay a tax to the government. So that will affect how you um, initially think out your production plans. Ultimately it's going to raise the, the costs of uh, supplying every unit that you sell. So it's certainly going to affect you. Um, other things that matter are things like the, the nature of competition in the bottled water market and the objectives that producers might have. So if there's a, a lot of competition in the market, you may actually find some quite vigorous uh, price wars going on, uh, or certainly healthy price competition, um, and that will influence what the nature of supply will be in that particular market. And again, we can see from empirical evidence that there are, are some key determinants of supply, just as there were with demand. And we can, we can express that in terms of a shorthand notation. And that's what we've done here, that we're saying that the quantity supplied of X, that's QSX, depends upon, or is a function of, that's equal to G here, all the variables in the brackets. We use G rather than F as we did before because we're saying that the, the determinants of supply are different to the determinants of demand. But therefore the quantity supplied of, of the good depends upon or is a function of all those variables in the brackets such as the price of X, PX, the price of uh, alternative products, the prices of inputs such as labour and raw material costs, the nature of technology and everything else that we haven't captured. Uh, might include taxes, for example, or subsidies. 
and again just to remind you it's merely a shorthand to capture the main determinants of supply it's not an exhaustive, an exhaustive list so how can we represent the supply function well just as with the demand function the um, relationship is between the price of the good and the quantity supplied per period of time and again this time we've, we've got um, price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis just as we did have with demand and we're assuming that this relationship, the relationship between quantity supplied and price is a caterous paribus relationship in other words that other things are held constant so what we're saying is that as the price of the good goes up more will be supplied and the reasoning is as we said before that if you supply one more unit it's going to cost you something to supply that unit and you're going to need a price to cover not only the costs of uh, labor and the costs of raw materials but also the, the returns that will keep you being a supplier of this particular good so it's a uh, a positive function, the relationship is a positive relationship as the price goes up from P1 to P2 the quantity supplied increases from Q1 to Q2 and it's now that we can start to bring together the market, bring together both demand and supply and when you look at demand and supply the uh, we've got a graph here which has uh, price and the quantity demanded and supplied per time period and um, if we have an equilibrium at uh, a price of OP and o OQ demanded and supplied so that is what the market is determined we talk about an equilibrium and the best way of explaining an equilibrium is to see when there isn't an equilibrium for example when prices are above the equilibrium level uh, for example at price P1 then the quantity demanded is 0QD and the quantity supplied is 0QS there is a surplus in the market more being supplied than being demanded at the price 0P1 and there are forces in the market both on the supply and on the demand side to push us down to P suppliers for example will have these extra stocks, this surplus and they will want to sell them off at lower prices and consumers uh, will only offer lower prices so there are forces going down the supply curve and down the demand curve to bring us back to the equilibrium uh, price and quantity of OP, OQ alternatively of course it could be the case that prices are below the equilibrium OP, OQ for example if prices were OP1 in this particular slide then the quantity supplied would be uh, OQS and the quantity demanded would be much greater OQD so there's more being demanded than being supplied at this price P1 so there's a shortage and again there are forces pushing up both of the demand and supply curve consumers perhaps those who really want this product maybe they've got higher incomes will offer the higher prices and suppliers will make more in search of the higher returns that are around because of the shortage so there are forces pushing us back to the equilibrium of OP, OQ ok so that explains the essence of the market the blades of the scissors as uh, Marshall quite descriptively uh, put them uh, demand and supply let's have a look at impacts in changes on market uh, changes in demand on market equilibrium now we've already um, seen this functional notation and uh, we've seen that QDX depends upon all those things in the bracket and that the demand curve just shows uh, a relationship between the quantity demanded of X and the price of X and that's a movement up and down the curve along the curve and it's an inverse relationship and we assume that everything else was equal we use the caterers paribus assumption but in fact if we change one of the other variables for example if income changed then that would shift the demand curve and that's uh, something we're just going to look at now 
so let's see what would happen if consumers uh, had higher incomes if that was the case then uh, we'd see at every price including P which we've got on this diagram more would be demanded at the old demand uh, D demand line D the price was OP and the quantity demanded was OQ uh, and with a new level of income the demand would increase from D1 remember that this graph is just showing a relationship between price and the quantity demanded per period of time it's not showing a relationship between income and quantity demanded uh, so we have to show how an increase in income would be represented on this graph which is just showing a relationship between price and quantity and the only way we can show it is by a shift in the curve so that the quantity demanded uh, that occurs through a rise in income is a shift or represented by a shift from D to D1 of course what we also need to consider is what would happen um, if there was an increase in demand uh, what would be the, the outcome change in the equilibrium position well uh, we've got to include the supply curve for that so if we include our supply curve S then what would happen is that the existing price of OP the um, quantity uh, supplied would be OQ remember the old demand curve D is not there anymore with this new level of income and that the quantity demanded, the new quantity demanded is with D1 is a quantity of OQ1 so we've got a quantity supplied of OQ and a quantity demanded of OQ1 we've got a shortage in the market and there are forces pushing up the demand curve and the supply curve to give us back A and give us, get us to a new equilibrium of P1 and Q2 the best way of understanding how markets change is to try some questions so we've got a question here, question one how will the market demand curve for coffee shift that is will it go to the left, will it go to the right, will it not change at all in each of the following cases and the first case we're going to look at is what happens if the price of tea falls will the demand for coffee shift to the left, will it shift to the right, or will it not shift at all but I'll let you think about that for a moment okay let's see what the answer is so did you get it right if the price of tea falls then the quantity demanded of tea rises now of course that's in the tea market we've been asked to look at the uh, impact on the demand curve in the coffee market so if the price of tea falls the quantity demanded of tea rises and that of course means that the demand for coffee will fall tea and coffee are substitute goods so if the price of a substitute falls that means that the demand for the particular product in our case coffee will fall to D1 the demand curve shifts to the left and we get a new equilibrium price and quantity of uh, OP1, OQ1 we've got lower prices and lower quantities and I've put the functional notation on the bottom of the slide just to remind you what's going on here remember what we said that the demand and supply curves just show a relationship between price and quantity if you want to show anything outside of that relationship outside of price and quantity so for example you want to show the relationship between with the price of substitute goods PY to PZ as indeed the price of T is a, a price of a substitute then that will shift the curve so we know the curve is going to shift and we've just got to work out which way it's going to shift ok another question then we've just seen what happens when the price of T falls but what happens to the market demand for coffee does it shift to the left, to the right or no shift if the advertising expenditures on coffee in the coffee consuming countries rises again I'll let you think about it ok let's see what the answer is
So, did you get it right? Well, if advertising expenditures rise, then you'd expect the demand for coffee to rise. And we can show this in our diagram uh, by shifting the demand curve to the right. So in the coffee market, the demand curve has shifted from uh, demand to D1. What we find is that prices have gone up from P to P1 and quantities have gone up from Q to Q1. So the new equilibrium is P1, Q1, higher prices and quantities because of this rise in advertising expenditures on coffee in these coffee consuming countries. And again, we could use our little functional notation to help us think through what would be happening. Here, we've said advertising expenditures uh, rise. Well, that's not in our, uh, our in, uh, little functional notation, at least it, as, as we can normally see it with the price of substitutes PY or complements PZ or incomes or taste, but it comes under that batch of other things which would be relevant in um, affecting demand and shifting the demand curve. So advertising expenditures lead to a shift in the demand for coffee to the right. So what about the factors that affect the supply curve? I put the functional notation down for the supply curve just to help you think through uh, what would happen to the demand and supply graph. We're going to ask some questions in a moment, but just to remind you, we've said that the quantity supplied of X depends upon, that's the G, it, it, it depends upon things like the price of X, the price of being in alternative activities, the price of inputs, the cost of production for example, the state of technology and all those other things, Z. And it's just those latter four things in the brackets, the price of alternative goods, the price of inputs, technology and all those multitude of other things that will shift the supply curve because the supply curve is just a relationship between the quantity supplied and the price of the good. Let's do some questions. Okay, question two. How will the market supply curve of coffee shift, that is will it go to the left, to the right or not shift at all, in each of the following cases? In this case, the cost of producing coffee falls because of a new roasting technique. So we've got the cost of producing coffee and it's going to fall because there's a new roasting technique. So does it go to the left, does the supply curve shift to the left, to the right or not shift at all? Again, think about it for a moment. Okay, let's find the answer. Okay, um, I hope you've got this right. If the cost of producing coffee fall, then more could be supplied at every price. An alternative uh, way of saying that is that, that at every quantity, it costs less to supply this good. So the supply curve has shifted to the right, or down if you'd like to think about it like that. The new equilibrium is P1Q1, with this uh, shift in the coffee supply curve to the right, then prices have fallen, the quantities have increased. And again, just to remind you that functional notation is there, if you look at the variable PI, that's the particular uh, variable that's been changed here, and that will shift the supply curve. You've just got to work out which way it's going to shift. Is it going to shift to the right or to the left? Okay, our second question on the market supply curve uh, is what would happen to the market supply curve of coffee if alternative products in supply became more profitable? Let's say that the price of cocaine rose. What would happen to the supply of coffee? Would it shift to the left, to the right, or would there not be any shift at all? Again, I'll give you a moment just to think about that. Okay, let's see the answer. Well, again, I hope you got this right. If alternate, alternative products rise in price, it means that they are likely to become more profitable. Therefore, suppliers will supply less coffee at every price and the supply curve shifts to the left. So, if I, in our case, if the price of cocaine rises, it's going to be an inducement to coffee growers uh, if they can switch 
their production into cocaine assuming of course they can get away with this but if, it, that, if the price shift is significant it may well induce them to move out of coffee production and into cocaine production so the supply of coffee would shift to S1 that's a, a leftward shift in the supply curve um, and prices will go up of coffee to P1 and the quantities of coffee in the market that are demanded and supply will fall to Q1 here then we're looking at in our terms of our functional notation uh, a change in PA which would again shift the, the supply curve ok let's finish by looking at some of the benefits of the market and we're going to look first of all at the demand side Equ equilibrium price and quantity as we saw bef before in, in the market is where uh, Marshall scissors come together where demand equates with supply that's at point A in this diagram where prices are OP and the quantities are OQ what people are willing to uh, pay for the product is equal to what uh, suppliers are willing to supply the product at uh, but you should remember as well that uh, on both the demand and the supply curve people were willing to, to uh, pay a higher price than OP just take for example prices OP1 there are some consumers who are willing to pay a price of OP1 but the market allows them to pay a price of OP so clearly those consumers have gained because of the market and of course there's a lot more consumers all the way up to OQ in terms of the quantity that are bought in, in the marketplace so along the line uh, B to A there are a whole range of prices above the equilibrium price that people are willing to pay remember the demand curve is a willingness to pay curve and we could show that willingness to pay for this particular product up to the uh, OQ in, in terms of the quantity uh, demanded by that orange trapezoid so the total willingness to pay could be shown as the area OBAQ that would be the total willingness to pay but of course the outlays by consumers are much lower than that they are OPAQ so that's the actual outlays that means of course that consumers have gained is what economists call a consumer surplus that's the area which is the willingness to pay less the payments that are made by consumers and that's given by the triangle ABP and it's an important part of uh, the market, it's an important benefit for the market consumers are gaining because of the market process and of course they can use this surplus on other goods and services what about suppliers? well remember suppliers will also gain from this because there are some suppliers who are willing to supply at a price like P1 so a price like P1 is uh, a lot lower than the market price so clearly any supplier willing to supply at a price P1 is going to get some extra benefit um, and we can show that in this demand and supply graph we're going to look at the supply curve for the moment so the revenues that would come into suppliers would be represented by OPAQ so that's the revenues now what about the costs of supplying, the variable costs of supplying um, these particular products well we can show that by this trapezoid OCAQ and what we said that some sellers are willing to supply this good at a much lower price than OP so along the line AC there are uh, suppliers willing to supply the good at a much lower price and therefore the, the costs of supplying that good are a lot lower so the total variable costs are OCAQ 
that means that producers will gain their incomes which we said were OPAQ are actually lower than the, the total variable costs in supplying this product OCAQ so they're going to get a surplus because of the market and that's another benefit from the market so what we can say is that both consumers and producers benefit from the marketplace and in this sense any interference in the market is seen to be detrimental to what's called economic welfare that is uh, because it, it actually interferes with consumer and producer surplus thanks very much for listening